Yeah. But you'll you'll notice, and I'm sure you have noticed, um, that in, in Jeremiah 31 where it says God will write uh, his law upon their hearts, and he doesn't identify that as the law of Moses. But mm -hmm. Whatever law it is, it's, of course I believe it's the new covenant, he, he's going to write it upon their hearts. But he says, he says very clearly... Um, Verse, let's see, yeah, verse 32 it says, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Um, so he says specifically that, that this, this new covenant, now this, this is not... And that's that's something else we need to emphasize. Yes. He says, I will make, in verse 31, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of, of, of Judah. So the very fact that it refers to it as a new covenant indicates that it's that it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same as what it was before. But yes, even, even going beyond that, yeah. he says, it's not going to be like the covenant I made with them when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So that, that seems to be clearly refer to the law that he gave them at Mount Sinai. It says, my, my new covenant is not going to be like that law. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to hear your uh, yep. response. So, what I see, uh, verse 32, not according to the covenant. My first question would be, like, what, what covenant? Um, because, for example, uh, we have a covenant together as a, as a married couple. Mm -hmm. We're married to each other, and that marriage covenant is a covenant mm -hmm. and you have covenants like um, when God destroyed the earth with water and then he sends a rainbow and says this is my covenant and my promise to you that I will never destroy the earth again in this in this context right here I believe we're speaking about a marriage mm -hmm. covenant mm -hmm. um, and the context with verse 31 it says uh, behold the days come saith Jehovah that I will make a new covenant with who the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that's one of the first things that, that struck me about this passage is, okay, who is the house of Israel and who is the house of Judah? I've come to learn that it is literally um, the tribes of Israel. It is the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Right. The northern kingdom were scattered uh, after many times scattered, and the Lord Jehovah brought them back like a woman committing adultery. Um, and he would take them back. But at, some, at one point, the last straw, he wrote a bill of divorce and scattered them indefinitely. Mm -hmm. But then he continues to go on through Scripture and say, I will bring you back to me, I will bring you back to me. And, and the question is, how is this going to happen? Because according to Torah, according to the law of Moses, if you write a divorce uh, and your wife goes on and marries another, she can't come back to you. Um, even if that even if that husband dies, she can't come back to you. She's unclean. She's un undefiled. So the question throughout the whole scripture is, how are you going to do this, oh God? How are you going to make this happen? You wrote a bill of divorce. You're saying you're going to bring them back. How are you going to make this happen? There's no way. And, well, he had a plan. It never said that if the first husband dies and resurrect, that wife can't come back to that new man. So I think God had a plan to bring back His original people. And not only that, but also the promise is that I'm going to bring those who are afar off, Gentiles, heathens, those who are not part of our nation, those who are not part of the remnant, the, the bride that I set apart uh, from all the other nations of the world. And that includes us, those of us who are not physical Jews or physical Israelites. We're Gentiles, but those, these specific... Um, the house of, of Israel and the house of Judah were physical Israelites and the house of Judah and I think reading it from this perspective it just totally changed it changes when you start reading Romans and you start reading where he's saying this is to those who are scattered the diaspora those who are are scattered in the nations uh, he's and when Jesus says go to the lost sheep of Israel don't go to the Gentiles go first to the lost sheep of Israel mm -hmm. It's, it totally shifts my mind because now it's, God is redeeming back the people that belong to Him 
and provided a way for them to come back. Um, and, and for us to come in as Gentiles, those who are not even part of uh, the covenant. So then, you think, let me make sure I understand, yeah, you think yeah. he's talking about uh, literal, biological Jews here? No, I think he's speaking of not, yes, in, in context, verse 31, he's speaking directly to these, but the thing is, it's in context of knowing that his goal way in the beginning with Abraham was to save many nations and to bring those who are afar off. Those who are afar off are, are real Gentiles, those who are not Israelites at all. But the thing is, fast forwarding to New Testament, when you get to the, the apostles' teachings and the Messiah already died and everything, you're still dealing with these Israelites who have been scattered for thousands of years. And so they still, they're still alive. They still have the bloodline. They're just, they're lost. They, they lost their identity. And um, so it's speaking to them. When you get to verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with them. So it's a different covenant because the, the old covenant says, you can't come back to me. Once I write a bill of divorce, you can't come back. So this new covenant is, I died and resurrected for you. Now you can come back. I'm a new man. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and and, and it, you know, in the same verse, it breaks it down. Uh, Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith Jehovah. So, I think that's. Um, I, I don't think necessarily it means that the complete Old Testament, everything, law and the prophets, are all abolished, erased, um, except for what we have in the New Testament. For example, I don't think it would be suffice to live as a believer on this earth with the books of Matthew to Revelation. I think all the word is inspired and breathed and, and, and good for teaching and, and um, you know, for righteousness. Mm -hmm. And we need the whole entire text. Right, um, right. But, uh, so, I, I don't know. Rick? I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to interject. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you won't get any disagreement on our part right there. I, I think what you're saying... And what, our, what we're saying is the same in this principle. Okay. You you recognize there are some laws that are not binding. I do. I do. And yet you still believe right that it's inspired and it's still profitable for teaching. Yes. We have the same understanding. Okay. It's just we would not limit it to, for instance, circumcision and the priesthood. Mm -hmm. But really, a law that is not binding is not useless. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. I that uh, that I, I, I think if, if, if we would be wrong in, in saying that there are some things that are not binding, uh, then you would have the same kind of issue, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. does that make, does that make okay. Yeah, well, so, the thing with me, and genuinely, honestly, I'm being honest, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really dug into this completely, each commandment, each law, um, even circumcision. Here's the truth. For both sides, both of us. Okay. None of the commandments, even that you got, let's say I keep the Sabbath, I keep the feast days, but you guys only, you know, you keep whatever, the Sermon on the Mount, you keep, you know, what the Apostle said, things like that. Whether it's your commandments or my commandments that I believe in, none of those commandments can save us. Uh, for a, a, a new believer, a brand new believer, let's say you see a sinner, you see somebody and you preach them the gospel, the basics, you know, they understand it. You only need to give them maybe about ten sins, and they, they all identify with all ten of them, and they know they're filthy and they need a savior. You know, in that moment, if they decide to put their trust in the Messiah and they believe with all their heart, you know, they're they they're they're saved. You know, then they gotta get baptized, all that in his name and everything. I think but, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I know you anyway. But the point is, you don't have to know the whole text, the whole scriptures or observe every single commandment to have that initiation to be grafted into the family of faith. Now, if you want to if you're living on this earth, because now your job is to renew your mind day by day to to pick up your cross daily and follow him and put put sin to death, you are obligated to study the text and to put to death anything that you need to put to death, right? So, um I consider the commandments that even we don't know are binding, are still binding. Whether we think they, whether we know or are aware that they are or not, they still are. 
they're just as much as binding as the ones that the sinner on your side doesn't know about yet or doesn't really fully comprehend. Uh, Darren, may I ask? Uh, well, our side. 